Grady Booch is one of the country's most prolific minds in software development, and he has been for many, many years. His work with the unified modeling language, his own ongoing contribution to the development of both the theory and practice of software with his handbook of software architecture, both of those have made him one of the leading minds uh, and leading thinkers in the field of software and software development. But the wonderful thing about Grady is that Grady is not just a thinker. Grady is a doer, uh, definitely a man of action. He has a very important role at IBM now as an IBM fellow. Uh, he is uh, working on some important and very, very large-scale software projects within IBM, and his designs and skills in software are part of the fabric of the code of a number of complex systems that are operating in almost every domain of computing that you could think of today. Uh, he finds time to write. He's written a number of books. He's an active blogger. Uh, and in, in the midst of all of that whirlwind of activity, he also serves as a trustee of the museum, and we're very glad to have him on the board. Grady has taken on a very large-scale and long-term project. He's doing it in partnership with us and a number of other people. Uh, it is a project that is entitled Computing the Human Experience, and it is a view of computing's impact on the world and the implications of computing for the future. If you think of Cosmos meeting computing, uh, which is probably something you'll hear more about directly from Grady, you have an idea of what he's going to be working on. As um, computing the human experience takes shape, both in form and substance, Grady is preparing a, a series of lectures that are going to help generate more ideas and more thinking around the computing project. Uh, and the one that he's chosen today is all about the relationship between computing and warfare. Uh, it's fun to think about computing's impact on things that launch and fly and spy and blow up, but it's not just about the drama of, uh, of the history of warfare and computing today. It's about the ethical and theoretical issues that we have to confront as a society as computing becomes ever more a part of that complex, uh, that complex process and set of values. So it's my pleasure to begin this session today. Uh, entitled Wo Woven on the Loom of Sorrow, and to welcome and introduce you all to Grady Booch. Software is the invisible thread, and hardware is the loom upon which we weave the fabric of computing. And this is a rich tapestry that we have now laid across all of the earth. Computing the Human Experience is a series that explores the coevolution of computing and humanity and the ways in which one has influenced the other. Today, we're going to look at one specific element of that, one part of the human experience, namely the coevolution of computing and warfare. Our story begins in what we in the West would call the Middle Ages, although in the Islamic world, this is the Golden Age. So let's come to a moment in the city of Baghdad on the east bank of the Tigris River, where we find a place called the House of Wisdom. Here was a place of learning, of meeting, a place where cultures could come together with acceptance of one another and where mathematics and, and, and science began to flourish. One man in particular, Muhammad ibn Musa al khwarizmi was at the center of a lot of this work. And it is from him we have the ideas that come from the Hindus that lead to modern numbers, the Arabic numbers. We have the idea of the algorithm and thus born the names algebra, the idea of bringing broken things together, that's what it is in Arabic, and algorithm. Now, algorithms, as, uh, as Knuth has noted, is at the core of what happens in computer science. It is the essence of what we try to do to find good algorithms and, and make those things manifest in the world. Algorithms can capture the process in something just as sacred as a Japanese tea ceremony, but also make itself manifest in these ways as well, ray tracing algorithms to you know, bring us uh, things from Pixar, uh, the algorithms that control communications in our iPhones behind Watson. All of these things are powered in some way or another by an algorithm. And yet, those same algorithms bring us the ability to have smart weapons that lead to destruction. So the same algorithms that we have that bring us joy and entertainment also lead us to conflict. And here we are again on the east bank of the Tigris River in the city of Baghdad during the Gulf War. 
The question for me, therefore, is what is the journey that led us from this intellectual flowering to the point now where we use these same kinds of ideas in incredibly destructive ways? What brought us from here to there, and how are we changed in the process? The story for me begins with human needs. There is a Chilean economist, Max Neve, who has this observation that all of human history is driven by human need. And these human needs are finite, they're, they're unchangeable throughout time and culture. What does change is how we as a culture react to them, the strategies we have against them. And these are some of the fundamental needs that he describes. Some of these needs in particular are very, very deep in our core. They relate to our need for survival, our need for freedom, our need for protection. And these three needs in particular, when we try to meet these needs, bring us in conflict with the needs of others. And so in many ways, conflict is sadly, tragically, a part of the human experience. The great uh, military strategist Clausewitz defines war as an act of violence that we use to compel our will against the will of others. And therefore, it's no surprise, he goes on to say, that we apply all the things of art and science to bring to bear to this nature of violence. We bring all of our creativity to it. It's also, therefore, no surprise that as we look back in time, we can find some of the greatest minds who also applied their energies to the sake of warfare. Da Vinci, look through his writings and look at the work he has done and you'll see he brought these fantastic machines of destruction, some of which never made it into fruition, but many of which did make a difference in the battles that took place then. We think of Galileo when he turned his eyes to the sky, to the heavens, and saw some amazing things. But you must also realize this is sort of a, a fall of the money kind of situation. Where did Galileo get the funds to do this work? Turns out that he was an advisor to the Venetian armory, and one of the first things he did with telescopes was to send a report to the armory saying, here is a great new weapon we can use because it allows us to see the enemy from afar. And only then later did he turn his eyes to the heavens. So even great minds such as him applied his art and science to the art of war. And so it goes. One of the things that happened in the 14th century that changed the face of war was the creation of gunpowder. War has needs, just like we as humans have needs. One of the needs of war is to provide the right kind of tip of the arrow, if you will, the greatest violence one can have with the greatest protection for the combatants. And one of the interesting things about the stirrup at first and then the gunpowder was that all of a sudden it changed the economics of warfare such that the king, who could own the gunpowder and, and afford it, kind of kept his prince and princesses at bay a little bit because he did the controlling. But now we had more science that was involved here because in the early battles, basically you do point blank putting the cannoneers together with one another and shoot horizontally. But it was discovered in the 1500s, if you elevate it a certain way, you can get a bigger, bigger distance. And if you use a different recipe for your gunpowder, you can do some interesting things. So notice this gentleman here with the little instrument in which he could take a look at what should he raise that cannon to a particular elevation so that he can get the best distance. Science began to enter the art of conflict. Enter John Napier. A lot of things happening in mathematics about this time, of course, but he brought to us a number of aids to calculation. Napier's bones, the notion of an algorithm, and now all of a sudden the calculation of these kinds of things, both for looking at the heavens as well as for killing our fel fellow man, could be made more efficient. Science tends to do that. This is not me on a bad hair day, I just want to assure you. <laughs> My wife has seen me like this, but it is the astronomer Herschel who was a friend of the young man on the side, Charles Babbage. One day they were apparently developing some tables. Tables were a big thing back then uh, because they were used for a number of reasons, some dubious reasons, you know, casting astronomical tables, some economic reasons such as what the British Navy needed, uh, the ephemeris tables so that I could, you know, tell where I was in the world. One day they were apparently calculating some tables, very, very tedious stuff, and, and, and Babbage exclaimed, my God, Herschel, I wish these things could be done by steam. 
he saw that there was a means of making this mechanized because he saw the hints of the algorithm below the surface. And of course, he had a hint of how he might proceed, and it was through the work of the, uh, the weaver uh, Jacquard. Now, weaving was an important thing economically, especially around the city of Lyons, but it was also an terribly labor-intensive kind of thing. So, gentlemen such as him said, what can we do to remove the repetitive nature of this thing and eliminate the human from it? A common thread we're going to see here, one of the many threads. And so he devised, as you well know, the jacquard loom. The cool thing about this picture on the bottom right is it's actually a weaving done on a jacquard loom of some 25,000 cards. Now, think of him as the original dot-com billionaire, because Napoleon thought this was pretty cool and gave him a lifelong pension and gave him a royalty for every loom that was created. So this guy was, was pretty happy. Not everybody was happy, though, especially those followers of the mythical General Ludd. And thus, we have born the Luddites, who were the first to break apart the looms, because they weren't too keen about what this mechanization was doing to them. Babbage, as you well know, went on to produce some elements of the difference engine. He got a little distracted, said, oh, squirrel, and went on to produce, well, not, maybe not quite that. No, don't quote me on that. That's probably not in, in history books. I'm not a historian. Went on to produce the idea of the analytic engine and the rest they see as history. There were others who followed him, of course, that produced this, and you can go see a replica of it downstairs, which is just wickedly cool. Now, here we are in a time where, in many ways, computing was simply a companion to war. As we went into battle, it followed along with us. We'd use it occasionally. Uh, it was certainly used in the calculations to determine latitude and longitude, an important piece of the tables we would find uh, for, for navigation. But as time progressed, and the fruits of the Industrial Revolution and the fruits of science came together, we found ourselves in a very different place. At the beginning of World War I, which was launched by the assassination of the Archduke Ferdinand, very curious thing happening here because we had a fragile set of interlocking treaties, and this one event is what caused the collapse of those dominoes, leading us to what then was called the Great War, and of course following, following the Great War was the Great Depression, and then the rise of fascism leading to the Second World War, in which truly we had the full force of science brought to the means of destruction. War has many needs, and one of those needs is to defend your borders and to keep others from coming into the war. This is exactly what Hitler did. He had some brilliant and yet terribly strange strategies, one of which was to deploy a number of U-boats in the Atlantic in the idea of, with sufficient chaos, he would keep the U.S. out of the war. It was also terrible for the British because it was the means of isolating them. And so penetrating their network was very, very important to the British. They had a need to break through that communication barrier. Now, here again, we find the full force of science applied to this because those messages were encrypted. Now, one of our politicians did a profoundly stupid thing. Now, that's a bit redundant, politician and <laughs> profoundly stupid, but... Sorry. But it was, it was Secretary of State Simpson, Stimson who said, you know, real gentlemen, do not read other people's mail. Well, how stupid, because that mail contained some incredibly profound bit of information. The British, on the other hand, had no difficulty with that, and what they were going after was trying to break the Enigma Code. The Enigma Code was a particularly challenging one. The Germans had, had, had basically taken over this idea from some folks from Poland, produced the device you see here in the, in the bottom left, and used it to good purpose. There was an even harder code, the Lorenz Code, which was used by the High Command, and the Purple Code as well used by the Japanese. But now our story goes to a place in Bletchley Park, north and to the east of London, where the British brought together 
uh, a code school and brought the best and brightest to apply their science and mathematics to try to break that code. One of those people, of course, was the, and here we have uh, the Bletchley Park as it was in those days. One of those people was the enigmatic, the brilliant mathematician, Alan Turing. Now, incredible guy, and go read some of his biographies, but amazing stories about him. You talk about a focused fellow, one of the stories goes to the fact that he apparently had a, a bicycle, and because parts were kind of short back then, it would slip its chain every 17 revolutions, so people would hear him going, pedaling down the road, and he'd be counting, one, two, three, four, five, hit 17, and then he'd do this little shuffle on his bike. Weird kind of stuff, but that's how focused he was. He basically took some of the ideas of Bayes, a theologian, and applied Bayesian techniques that led him to find some very, very clever ways to break these codes. Now, he did some other things as well. He was well known to von Neumann. He had these forays into what he thought was computable, and I love this one. He happened to be at AT&T and said he thought the brain was computable. He thought there were algorithms for the brain. And so he reported in this cafeteria that he's not looking for a, a, a big brain, just a mediocre one like the president of AT&T. I don't think he got invited back, just my guess, but perhaps it's so. He went on to produce the bomb, which was a set of ways that could determine the wheel settings on an enigma. And it took a long time for the bomb to do what it needed to do. These things were horribly no noisy kinds of things. But then there was a breakthrough because of a very, very human mistake. Humans, we now have humans as computers, often women in this case, would go through the cribs, the hints they would find. But one very important hint came about because of, of a, a lackadaisical enigma operator who was sending a message from Vienna down to Athens in which he repeated the same message twice without changing the wheels on the enigma code. And from that, they found a new way to attack the code. So taking Turing's brilliant idea, we have the addition of a brilliant engineer in the name of Tommy Flowers, who then produced the Colossus. And the Colossus was an amazing device. If you have a chance to go to Bletchley, go see it. It is just wickedly cool. The late Tony Sale produced a version of it. Bring us now to a few days before D-Day. The first Colossus is up and running. And here Eisenhower has just been delivered a message decoded from the Lorenz Code in this case, in which it said, a message from Hitler to Rommel saying, Dear Rommel, I doubt it said Dear Rommel, but hey Rommel, if there's going to be an attack in Normandy, just ignore it, because I think it's a head fake, and don't move your troops for five days. Eisenhower got that the day before D-Day. And so we hear in the press and the movies about the wrangling over the, over the, uh, the weather Reality is, at that point in time, Eisenhower knew that their head fake of the Normandy operation was fulfilled. Hitler had no idea what was going on, and so he said, we go tomorrow. The decoding of the, the Lorenz Code, because of the work of Colossus, because of the work of Turing, led us to D-Day, and that's an amazingly powerful event in time. Now, this led us to some ethical issues. Because we knew, because we were reading their mail, we knew before the, the Germans knew what was going to go on. So there are many circumstances documented where we knew there was going to be attacked by U-boats, and yet if we declared to our convoy to go change course, the Germans would get some hint that we had broken their codes. And so the decision was sometimes made that we would let those convoys go, knowing full well that they would be attacked, and knowing full well people would be killed. The ethics of computing are in full force upon us, and they often have tragic consequences. After the war, Turing fell into obscurity because at the end of the war, Churchill made the declaration that every bit of this project will be broken up into a piece no larger than a man's fist. He called the people at, Betch at Bletchley the geese that did not cackle because there was no disclosure from anyone until the 70s when this was made public that this even existed. So Turing went off into obscurity. He tried to find a new job. He was just another out-of-work mathematician, and so he was not viewed as special by anyone else. As you may know the story, he was robbed at one time. In his statement to the police, he disclosed that he had a partner, a male lover, and the sodomy laws were such that he was actually prosecuted, chemically castrated, and then uh, 
committed suicide. The man whose work had saved the war by two years was in turn killed by the machinery of the state that he saved. Tragic case. I would not be here were it not for Turing, because if the war had indeed gone on for two more years, my mother would have never met my dad. My mother was born in Essling in Germany. My father was part of the Allied forces, became uh, the provost marshal of, of Hamburg, and the two met there. And if we're not for Turing, I would not be here for you today. So, thank you, Alan. Yeah, pretty amazing. Wow. Boy, the stories I could tell you. <laughs> but I'm not. That we have in, in the UK. Let's take a look now in the US, where we had a different set of needs. So we were not so much under siege, and we could take the full force of our industrial might and apply it. Thus was born, led by Vannevar Bush, the National Defense Research Council, the Research Board, which was, among other things, the focus behind the Manhattan Project, but also launched so many other things. Let us go now to the Aberdeen Proving Grounds, where we had a particular problem we were dealing with, and it goes back to the old age issue of gunpowder and artillery. Seems that, especially in North Africa, we had these, these really long distance artillery called the long toms, and we produced these amazing uh, firing tables for them. In these cases, we were shooting something that could go at least 60 miles. So little bits of thing off made a big difference. And the firing tables here could contain variables as many as 500 different aspects. Things like the, the wind speed, the humidity, the temperature, the temperature of the gunpowder, for God's sake. And so the, the joke was often that the paperwork that followed the guns was often as heavy as the guns itself. And the tables that we sent to North Africa were wildly inaccurate. So what could we do to increase our science to make these things more accurate? Thus, Vannevar Bush and others brought to full force the notion of a differential analyzer, which we could apply with our human computers again to help us build these tables, to build the, the firing models for these guns, using them at the Aberdeen Proving Grounds. You hear the stories of Rosie the Riveter. We also have the top secret Rosies a number of women who worked in obscurity, much like back in Turing's days, Turing's time, to do this very, very tedious mechanical calculation. Now, here again we applied our full force of our engineering talent. And what you're seeing is this, this very bright thread that leads us from the needs of war, pushing back as an engineering solution that leads us to increasing levels of automation that bring us to modern computing. We have uh, Aiken, who really pissed off IBM because he worked with IBM to develop the Mark I, basically took all the credit for it. Watson was not a happy man, and so I must say, thank you, IBM, for letting me do this. I have to say that for, for our lawyers, so thank you. Not going to make Aiken's mistake. Uh, along the way, by the way, one of the programmers that, that was with this project is the indomitable Grace Murray Hopper. She was there to, as one of the programmers, basically looking out for, for the Navy's needs in this case. This is a Navy project. By the way, extra points for those of you who come up to me afterwards and explain to me what the meaning of that clock is. You can talk among yourself. No fair Googling it, please. <laughs> the next phase of evolution was done by uh, Eckert and Mockley. About nine months after Pearl Harbor, Mockley wrote this paper saying, you know, wait a minute, we could take the notions of vacuum tubes to accelerate switching because they're a lot faster than the relays, and thus was born the ENIAC. Now, in war, well, even now, egos are kind of big. And so the gentleman who was leading that project, Goldstein, who you see there in that, that uh, iconic picture, happened to be waiting on the train station in Aberdeen one day, and von Neumann came up to him, and they were just chatting away. And from that conversation, Neumann found out about the presence of the Enigma, and this just lit him up. He was dealing with a number of things, calculations associated with the Manhattan Project, and both of these projects couldn't talk with one another. And so we see here the unification of two threads that yielded a wonderful, remarkable event. After the war, we had the, the, the Moore School lectures, uh, the creation of the first report for the EDVAC, which led us to the formulation, the, the, the groundbreaking work for what we have in modern stored program computers. Now, 
Von Neumann got a little bit more of the extra credit because these, he happened to write the report, but these ideas were floating around with Mockley and, and Eckert and a lot of the crew in this space. Now from here we had just this amazing flowering. Starting from the ENIAC, this tree of computing began to explode. And this, this curiously I found in an army report. So it gets you the sense for how much the military was part of the fertilization of what was going on here. But there was something more we could do. Von Neumann recognized that we could apply this in the full force, the art and science toward conflict, but there were other things we could do with it as well. Now, World War II vastly reshaped the landscape of things. Now, now bear with me a moment because we're doing a bit of a change in what computing is doing for us. Computing had been, in the early ages, a companion to war. And now, fully, it was an instrument of war. We had applied it to full effect to counter some of the needs of warfare for reading other people's mail, for defense. And after the war, things changed because now we could use it to feed the insatiable diet of other needs of the war. The war reshaped the world, obviously, and many parts of the world, however, were in ruins. Were it not so, the story of computing would be very different because there was a very, very, very brilliant man, Konrad Zuse, in Germany who had developed the Z1, the Z2, Z3, and he was doing so to deal with a very different problem, the problem of flutter and aircraft wings, and use the Z3 for that very purpose. He had some brilliant ideas, indeed, in some ways, ahead of what we were doing here, and yet it never reached the flowering because of the destruction that came around him. He also, very importantly, never had the ecosystem, the infrastructure that would feed him in this body of knowledge. So you saw this back in uh, Mohammed ibn Musa's time, where you had this flowering of events. He did not have it, but it was beginning to develop in the United States, and that made all the difference. The U.S. won, and so here we were in a place as the only major intact power, and that gave us amazing possibilities. And so you see that in the flowering of computers at past tense. So if you move forward in time, in green we have the number of computers in the world produced by us, and then the computers in the world produced elsewhere. What I find striking about this is that we can count them. <laughs> if you, like, my gosh, we knew how many there were. And if you were to count them today, it would be, and I gotta use this, billions upon billions of computers. <laughs> Thank you, Carl. What did we fear? We feared the Soviets. Just as Churchill was fearing the Soviets, that fear began to expand. Remember bomb shelters? I certainly do. We had several on our block, and it was the cool thing to happen. But it wasn't just the idea of building bomb shelters. It was very much in the oxygen that we breathed. I remember having these little exercises in school where if the bomb flashes, then go off and do this. And so you would see these reports. All right, I feel safe. I feel empowered by my government. You'd never hear a government using fear to get you in action, would you? It's just unheard of. <laughs> never. I spoke earlier of one of the bright threads that brought us here through the line of ENIAC and EDVAC and so on. Another one of those bright threads that weaves us is this confluence of people. And so it's not just the technology that brought us to this point that led us to this transformation, but it's the vast restructuring that happened between science and academia and industry. It was utterly reshaped. So one of the things that happened after the war was the creation of the Rand Corporation. Hap Arnold, the general of the Air Force, happened to have about $10 million lying around. That was a lot of money back then. And he had these visions for long-term strategic bombing and therefore started the Rand Corporation. We'll see them pop up again in our story, but among other things, they were dealing with one of the other needs of war, namely, how do I get people from place to place at the right time in the right place, operations research, and from this was born the simplex method, another algorithm applying to, in this case, the needs of war, which had many other needs as well. 
MIT emerged from the war with a staff twice as large as they entered it, an operations budget four times as large, and a research budget ten times as large. So they were awash in cash. And therefore, they set up then the, the instrumentation laboratory, which was initially used to deal with navigation systems for the Thor missiles. Here we are deep in the space age. And of course, this same lab went on to do the guidance systems for the Apollo. It is from MIT as well that the whirlwind came to be. What need was this meeting? The Army, I'm sorry, the Navy in this case had a need to build simulators because we had all these different kind of aircraft. And so they took some of the mechanical simulators and said, we can automate this thing, and thus was born the Wilwyn Project, which had amazing transformative powers in terms of the technology and the form we have in our computing systems. Sputnik startled us. And I remember when this happened, and when the reports came out, it was like, crap, we didn't see that one coming. And so when the Soviets launched Sputnik, we launched into action. And one of the things that Eisenhower did was to create ARPA, because we did not want to be surprised again. And one of the people behind ARPA, specifically the, um, the uh, Information Processing Techniques Office, was Licklider. And he, know, as you may know, went on to lead Project Mac. Project Mac led us to the first time-sharing system. So we can see this amazing flowering of computing coming from the needs of war. Fear is a great motivator. And we talk about the, the civil defense stuff. What were we worried about then? We were worried then about the threat, at this time, of the threat of the Soviet bombers. And so thus was formed these three lines. And the, the, the far end of it was the distant early warning line. Taking the ideas from whirlwind, it was realized we could apply that to feed information from our radar and build a command and control system that led us to the automation of the dew line, the semi-automatic automation. And if you have a chance here, if you haven't been to the museum before, go down and see one of these and take a look for the ashtray in one of these things, a real sign of the times. My iPhone does not have an ashtray app, I assure you here. MITRE was formed for this. So here we see RAND and ARPA and the MIT group and now MITRE Corporation, these groups of the industrial scientific complex coming together because of war, fighting this fear and the needs of war. Bell Labs comes onto the scene. And if you think back to the invention of the transistor, it also has its roots in war. Part of what was going on with the SAGE system was the need for these longer distance radar, and that meant higher frequency radar, which meant higher powered radar, which meant the vacuum tubes weren't good enough for us. And so there was tremendous research in a number of places that led us to an understanding of how we could do switching at the level of semiconductor devices. And of course, Schottky and his crew developed the junction transistor, primarily at Bell Labs as a need to deal with these radars. I'll say it politely, Shockley was not a nice man. <laughs> he was, I'll just leave it at that, he's not a nice man. <laughs> and so the traitorous eight left him, formed Fairchild, but Fairchild has a military story as well. One of the first, it, it, with any company, if you've, if you've done a startup, here they were in a startup mode, where's the money coming from? Well, in this case, IBM had been tasked to do the guidance system for the XB-70, a new range of bombers. There was a transformation going on in the bomber community and in the reconnaissance community, moving from photographic reconnaissance to digital reconnaissance, and in uh, the move from bombers that were these long lumbering things to these supersonic kinds of things. There was a need for a lot of circuitry in them. And in this case, IBM said, we need some transistors that are hardened in a particular way. Uh, we need to go buy them. They went to Fairchild, and that was their first major contract, apparently, and that kind of got them going from there on. And the rest, they say, is history because so much in Silicon Valley came because of the flourishing, uh, the flourishing of Fairchild. Another element that played a role here was the move toward integrated circuits. Weight became an issue. As we moved into the Minuteman era, we wanted to have better navigation systems, and we weren't going to put an ENIAC inside one of these things but you're going to put more and more components. Indeed, the guidance system for a Minuteman, and I think we have at the museum some bits and pieces of it here, contains some 15,000 discrete components, about 2,000 integrated circuits, and Noyce and crew having invented the integrated circuit, who were they selling it to? Until about 1963, virtually all of the world's productions of integrated circuits went either to the Apollo program or to the Minuteman program. 
follow the money, and that's what drove us along in many cases. Another thing that was happening around this time is it was no longer just the hardware, but it was the software. And it was through the NATO conference that we had the first understanding of what software engineering was. And software was becoming a dominant factor. Uh, a dear friend of mine, uh, Barry Bain, tells the story that he was working on a satellite project and one day a, a gentleman came in, he was the weights guy, because weights and management is very important on these devices. The guy came in and said, uh, Dr. Bain, tell us how much your software weighs. And Barry said, it weighs nothing. And the gentleman said, it has to weigh something. Go think about it for a while and get back to me. Barry thought about it for a while. The guy came back and said, Dr. Bain, tell me how much your software weighs. And Barry said, look at this stack of, of cards over here. That's my software. Very good. How much does that stack of cards, how much does your software weigh? And Barry said, it weighs nothing. He said, my God, it cannot be so. Look at all those punch cards. It was, must weigh several pounds. And Barry went on to say, the software is not the cards. The software is in the holes. Software is the invisible thread. It truly is. Here we are deep in the Minuteman era, and all of a sudden the threat from the Soviets begins to increase because now we're in the age of mutually assured destruction. So what you going to do? One of the things we can do is instead of having these static places, we launch our missiles, we put them on rail cars. And now we can move them about the world. But that creates a problem, because when you launch one of these things, you've got to know very precisely where it is. This, by the way, is the same problem that Harrison faced back in the 1800s when he was dealing with navigation for the longitude problem. You need a very accurate timepiece. He did it with a mechanical clock. We did it because of work from one of our national laboratories to the atomic clock. The needs of the atomic clock came from the needs of war. The other thing that was devised from this was from a study that said, what would happen if we put a constellation of some 24 satellites around the world so that at any one point in time, we could triangulate from at least three of them to tell us where, they, where we are? Thus was born the Global Positioning Satellite System. I know where I am on my smartphone, thanks to war again. Now, in this context, war was becoming very, very complex. And so we had these needs for command and control, and thus was born from SAGE to the worldwide command and control system. Tremendous network leading us to the uh, North American Air Command in Cheyenne Mountain, you see the bit there, and one of the control centers. We so feared the Soviets bombing us, we had to carve out the inside of the mountain and put our computers inside of it. So this is a mountain that contained computers. Talk about, talk about a hard shell for your computer. That's, that's pretty amazing. But one thing that happened along the way in this communication network, so there was a bit of sabotage. Two microwave towers were sabotaged in Utah, and that caused people to freak, saying, oh my gosh, in the time of war, worse things are going to happen. What are you going to do? And so Paul Barron, back to Rand, had this notion of, can we build a distributed network that allows us to communicate? Now, there's misunderstanding that happens with regard to the history of the ARPANET because of this report. To be excruciatingly clear, the ARPANET itself, and then what followed, was not born directly because of war. But rather, I like to describe it as that the internet as we have it today was the plumbing was created because of warfare. The notion of packet switching came from here, and it laid the technical foundations to what we could do. Nonetheless, as you look at the early days of the ARPANET, trying to collect, trying to connect several research computers together, that was the problem. Most of those research activities, by the way, were funded by ARPA. So if you follow the money without the military, we would have been in a very different place. There was another arms war going on, and that was the area of supercomputing. And what fueled a lot of the supercomputing work was the national labs were, had this insatiable appetite for computation. The ill-fated ILIAC was funded back in this time by the government as a means of looking at massive parallelism. Never quite made it, but um, Seymour Cray saw the secret sauce, and thus was born the whole line of computers around the Cray, the first of which went to our national labs. Indeed, there was an important element to it because it was a key, because we had the power to supercomputing. We could then uh, rightfully sign the non Nuclear Nonproliferation Act because we knew the Soviets did not have that computational power. We had the edge that they did not. An example of computation as a strategic advantage in warfare. Vietnam, terribly tragic time for us. 
From a technological point of view, this was the place where the first battlefield computer was used. Putting in a van at Chu Chi, uh, uh, Vietnam, we had a machinery that would handle usual paper kinds of things, but also artillery planning. First use of a battlefield computer. But McNamara had a very curious way of looking at the war, maybe coming from his ideas from the Rand Corporation. And one of those of which is, it's the idea of body counts and, and basically finding a set of equations that define it. There's this delightful quote that comes from ben General von Eugengiap, who was the chief commander for North Vietnam. And he said, you guys screwed up. In America, you had a view that you could treat warfare as a mathematical problem. It was not. It is not a matter of adding and subtracting and listening to what your computers say. If it were so, you would have won the war. So this is very telling for me because it says that we may have this great focus upon computing, and yet in the process we may lose track of the, fi the fact that, that warfare is an incredibly intimate thing that impacts us in so many ways. And now here are, here are we, we are here again on the east bank of the Tigris River in Baghdad, the first information war. The confluence of computing has brought us such that we have moved from computing as a companion to war and now an instrument to war, it becomes a place to war. Because we use the full force of all of our work upon us. This is the war. This is the war that we brought real time into our homes. Thanks to the communication networks that were out there, we could visit war. And I love this observation that in the Gulf War, an ounce of silicon was more powerful than a ton of spent, spent uranium. It made strategic difference. We did it because we applied the full force of our computing technology to dominate space. We employed every satellite we had. We dominated air through the AWACS that you see there. We dominated the land communication and the first use of smart weapons. Again, moving from gunpowder to these incredibly precise kinds of things. A lot of this was responsible thanks to the DARPA Strategic Computing Initiative. We talk again about the confluence of people and ideas. The Strategic Computing Initiative was an important meeting of minds, and it brought us the ideas behind very large-scale integration and the risk processor. It brought us the notion of target recognition, which led us to, this, to, the, uh, to the smart weapons we spoke of. It led us to the beginning of these unmanned vehicles, and it led us to some advances in supercomputing. The connection machine came out of these ideas. It led to some incredible ideas in, uh, in artificial intelligence as well. And it led to this, the Aspen movie mapping system. This looks like Google Street View, but it's not. This was done in the 80s. The problem we're trying to deal with is, if I have a set of troops and I'm putting them into combat, I may not know what that situation looks like. How can I inform them what's going on? Well, let's take a full view of what's happening there and deliver to these people a virtual view of that city. Thus was born the mapping system, years and years ahead of its time. What do we fear? We have come to the place where war has changed us and we have changed war. What do we fear? We fear the terrorist. We fear the disruption of our infrastructure through cyber attacks. We fear duty, dirty weapons. So again, being in this place, how do we apply the arts and sciences we have to push back against these forces of war? We apply all that we know in computing to do so. We fear something that's very clear and present today. Those others may be fears kind of out there, but these are two very real fears. If you look at what's happening in Iraq, this shows us the range around which we can, uh, they can launch potentially a weapon, reaching quite distant places. Look at North Korea as well, too. How do we fight that? The full force of our computing technology. We apply unmanned aircraft. A lot of the targeting ideas that came out, the unmanned aircraft lead us to this place. Fifty nations are invested in Predator aircraft these days. Indeed, I would claim, in talking to my Air Force buddies, we have probably created the last manned fighter 
because the next generation of fighters will not require humans within them. This creates some very interesting challenges. How do we wake up in the morning, kiss your kids goodbye, go off and kill someone and come back? How does that affect us? And furthermore, what does this mean from just the rules of law perspective? There are some very legitimate questions on the table about the use of targeted killing, because that's effectively what it's doing. Is assassination part of the laws of war? We don't know. It's something that we must consider. Another way that war helps us, or one of the needs of war, is that we don't want to have people in harm's way. So the creation of these autonomous vehicles, why do you think we're putting so much money there? We want to put these vehicles into play to keep us at arm's distance from the enemy themselves. And thus, DARPA has been spending a lot of energy here. Google, by the way, hired many of the, uh, a number of the folks from some of the teams that have worked on these projects. Not only have we gotten to smart bombs, we are now in the age of smart bullets. And so at the Sandia Laboratory, we are at a place now where we can send a small bullet-like projectile directly to a specific target. Imagine now truly targeted killing to an individual on a street. We have the means. There are some things we know we can do, but the question for us is, should we do them? This one freaks me out. Stands about this high. It's a thing called Big Dog. And rather than schlepping, rather than schlepping all of my gear into, the, into combat, let's get one of these things. You know, back in World War I, we used horses. Imagine now using these automated devices. But not just a single device. A lot of the energy going on in swarm robotics is happening here. What happens if you take a swarm of nanobots, this digital dust, if you will, and put them into a site and gather reconnaissance information or perhaps even fire weapons? In fact, let's arm the soldier to the degree where he or she has a full view of the battlefield around them. Just last week, Honest to God, ARPA, DARPA announced a program called the Avatar Program, seriously, which is attempting to take the soldier out of combat, but give them the same kind of picture that a predator does and the ability to fight without being there. What does it mean to fight a war when you are not there? What does that do to us? There's this great mythology of Talos, uh, coming from this, the, the island of, of Cyprus. Talos was this, this demigod who would circle Cyprus three times a day and he would hurl stones at anyone who came nearby because there was this fear of Helena being kidnapped. Now, the downside of this is Helena was a bit of a captive of her own island because she was safe, but safe may not be necessarily the thing you want. And in a similar way, what we fear has surrounded us and trapped us as well. We go through airports and we are scanned. We carry our cell phones, cell phones through the world and we know where people know where we are. We are under the watchful eye of many surveillance devices. Our internet traffic is watched. We are in this blanket of computing and how does that change us? Now, you have to realize that the bad guys, if I may call them that, very emotional term, are using the technology we have invented in a great way, in, in a way to, that they can apply the full force as well, too. There's this delightful Twitter conversation that's going on. On the left-hand side, if you come up to me afterwards, I'll give you the Twitter feed, there's a group from Al-Qaeda that's throwing taunts at us via Twitter about the terrible things going on. And so shortly thereafter, we in the Allied forces set up another Twitter feed that are fighting against them. So you have this taunting going back and forth. It reminded me of the scene from, from uh, Monty Python <laughs> and, and the search for the Holy Grail in which the, the, the French guy is up there taunting the other, uh, the other British saying, your, your father smells of elderberries and I, I fart in your general direction. This is cool. I get to say fart on PBS. This is great. You may want to edit that one. I don't know. But that's the, kind of, that's, the kind of, that's the kind of taunting that's going on. But it's more than just taunting because Al-Qaeda is using this for recruiting, for all sorts of things in communication to bring the full force of what they are doing there. So what do we fear? We have created the U.S. Cyber Command because we fear cyber attacks. The network is continuously under attack and now very much computing has become the place where warfare happens. 
The first cyber war has happened in the state of Georgia. Russia was not happy with what Georgia was doing, so they launched, launched a denial of service attack upon all of the Georgian infrastructure. This is a picture taken from defacing uh, some of the, the web pages on the Georgian sites in which they were equating, equating their president with Hitler. So it was a nasty, nasty war, but it was a war that was happening underground. The stuck next worm is, in a way, part of a cyber war. It was the first targeted virus that we applied. Well, when I say we, I don't know who the we is. That's left up for debate yet. Was it us? Was it the Israelis? Hard to say right now. Targeted at the infrastructure within the Iranian nuclear power plants. That targeted a very specific kind of processor used in the industrial techniques. Here's the question for me then. Remember back to Ferdinand? Killed by one bullet. We had this interlocking set of treaties. Today we have that set of treaties. Is an act of cyber warfare an act of war that could cause the collapse of these treaties as well? Frightening prospect. Einstein observed that, and this is in the height of the Cold War, he didn't know how World War Four was going to be, three was going to be fought, but he knew that World War Four was going to be fought with sticks and stones. From my point of view of the world, I know how World War III is going to be fought. It's going to be fought with ones and zeros, and already has in some ways. Now, to be clear, I am not here to celebrate war. War is a terrible thing. And in many ways, however, I recognize that war is a part of the human experience. We must accept that. War has changed the face of computing, but at the same time, computing has changed the face of warfare. And in the process, it's changed all of us. I think our responsibility, therefore, is to take what we have done with this marvelous technology that has been forged in the fire of warfare and use it so that we may take, move from conflict and move from there to connection. That we may move from destruction to delight and move also from persecution to liberation. The story of computing is the story of humanity, and it's a rich, rich story. Thank you for coming along on this journey. Well done. I think you and I should both uh, thank uh, Jan Booch, who's sitting here oh, in yes. front, too, who is uh, the inspiration behind uh, a great deal of this. And I also have a lot of the team, our core team for Computing the Human Experience here. Go stand up, guys. Sell yourself now. The, the team in front. The team uh, in front here. All volunteer at this all, point. All volunteers. Yeah, thank you all. If you have some questions, by the way, please do feel free to pass them on up. Larry is still here and can collect the cards. He's back there in the corner. Oh, that's why he was wandering around. He's wandering around, I thought yeah. he was lost. No, no. Uh, he's, he's, he's collecting these cards. So let me, you know, let me ask you a question first, though. What, what did you, if you were to extract one central lesson from this in the, in the research and the months that you've been working on this particular part of the series, what, do, what have you learned that maybe was unexpected or a new piece of learning for you? What was unexpected? That's a great question. I think my biggest learning from this is that we do have this deep responsibility. We have created this this amazing technology, and it can do some things that perhaps we should not do. And so this notion of bringing ethics to our technology is a theme that I saw repeated again and again through time that I did not realize was there, but it certainly is in full force now, given what we can do with computing technology. That's interesting. So let me ask you then, as someone who's involved on, on the inside, very much on the inside, not, not of projects related to warfare necessarily, but someone Actually, I am, but we in the industry. <laughs> uh, how does a discussion about the ethics involved in some of the things you're talking about penetrate into that community? You know, that's a good one. Um, I actually have written some pieces about this, and the reaction I'm getting to it tends to be binary. Some people will say, ethics has nothing to do with technology. I say, well, let's go have a beer and talk about this one. Others will say, wow, I wish we would hear more about this kind of thing. So actually, I tend to bring it up in my discussions with executives primarily, mm. saying, now, wait a minute, step back. Take a look at perhaps some of the unforeseen circumstances that may come about based upon what you're doing. Get off of what your next quarter is going to do, but will you step back with me for a moment and consider what does this mean? And being a fellow, I can 
sometimes tell customers, that's profoundly stupid, let's talk. <laughs> so they give me the license to do, they, do that. Do you find I say that, in a polite way. Is that, is that, is it making it in? Is that conversation making its way in? I think that this is something that has to be done, you know, one bit at a time. That all I can do is lay the seeds and get people to think. Indeed, one of the things we hope to do with the series is we want to create a dialogue. And that's the best I can do. Mm. I don't have all the answers, but I'd like to get the people together that can have that discussion and so that we as a culture can come to the right place. Mm. If you gave this talk, this is the first question I'm going to ask you, if you gave this talk 50 years from now, what do you think the highlights would be? Wow. It would be a longer talk. <laughs> <laughs> That's a great one. What is war going to look like? I'll tell you what my hopes are, but then I'll tell you what my fears are. Okay. My hopes are is that computing will have had the unexpected benefit of connecting us in so many ways that we will have learned one another's humanity on a personal level such that war of this nature will be less necessary. That's my hope. My fear, thanks. My fear is that it will be part of the escalation and such that we will get to the point where we wrap ourselves like Helena did around Telos, wrap ourselves in this so much, we'll be so fearful, we put ourselves in these electronic boundaries. I hope we don't go that direction in 50 years from now. You mentioned Stuxnet and in this place of warfare now that computing has become. As someone who's so involved in writing and, and, and working on these large-scale software projects, are you optimistic that the, the solutions or the defenses against this kind of software-based warfare can stay ahead of the attacks themselves? The defense against the black arts in right. some ways. Yeah. Um, I have great confidence in the human spirit to be able to adapt. And so, like any engineering problem, there will be some who keep finding the holes in this and advancing us forward. So I am reasonably confident that we will be able to stay ahead of the power curve in that, large, in that regard. I'm not concerned. I know that there will be incidences in which terrible things leak through. But on the whole, I, I feel good about where we're headed. And the technology itself that exists today, do you really see that? as a bulwark against that? It's not so much the technology that's the bulwark, but it's the humans within it that I believe are providing the right kinds of insights that get us there. One of the things that I've realized in developing this whole series is that we are, intentionally or not, as a species, slowly but inexorably surrendering ourselves to computing technology. And that's both a good thing and a bad thing. I am hoping that as we move more of our life into computing, that our values will be brought into that as well, too. We can't automate love, we can't automate uh, generosity, but I hope that the mechanisms we build don't lead us to a 1984 kind of scenario, which is totally cold and devoid of human spirit. So one final question, because we, we do like to stay roughly on schedule for these lunchtime events. Talk a little bit about the overall project, because this sure. is actually, it ranges well beyond what you're talking about right. today. So you are a unique audience because, frankly, we want to open up the ideas of computing the human experience to the general public. Um, Carl Sagan has this notion that the world depends exquisitely upon science and technology, and yet most of the world does not understand science and technology. The same is true with computing. The world depends exquisitely upon computing technology. It has woven itself in the interstitial spaces of our lives, and yet you go up to the average person and they have no idea how this stuff works. And therefore you see these bizarre laws that come out, or reactions that happen when a certain cyber event happens, where people are reacting in strange ways because they don't understand it. The goal of what we're trying to do with this series is to open the curtain for the general public under the idea that a, a, an informed populace is better able to understand its past, reconcile its present, and be intentional about its future. We want to open the curtain on computing. And the, the structure we're doing that in is really telling the story of computing and humanity and how those two have co-evolved, driven by human needs, and with each of the episodes looking at it from different aspects of the human experience. Today we have war, but we have ideas of talking about uh, computing in faith, computing in science, computing in the arts, computing in what does it mean to be human as we move towards sentient devices. So it's a fascinating journey. And it will open both the optimism and the 
the not so optimistic side of computing at the same time, won't it? Uh, it will, and I hope that we touch a generation of people who can contribute to choosing which path that will be. Talk, just one more quick question. Sure. Talk a bit about the, this word that we've all discovered in the process of this, the transmedia nature oh, transmedia. Of, uh, of producing a project like this. Transmedia means that it's no longer just, here's a box DVD set. But now all of a sudden we, st we tell the story in a variety of mediums. We'd like to deliver some of this to public broadcast on PBS or BBC. We'll stream across the web. We'll tell some of the stories on the web itself. We have a series of iBooks and apps. In the 80s, uh, the, uh, the BBC launched the BBC Micro, which has changed a generation of people who could now fill it with this computer. We'd like to do a similar kind of thing and maybe latch together with the, uh, the Alice Project or the Code Academy or some open source hardware project to deliver a same kind of thing for, for this generation. Mm -hmm. So transmedia means there is no single form of media in which we tell the story because there's a rich way we'll apply that story. Indeed, we're using the fruits of computing to tell the story of computing. Grady Booch, thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you, John. Thank you for being a part of it. It's been a pleasure.